Good evening, and welcome to the 2022 Ellingham Festival Poetry and Flash Fiction Awards. Those of you who are watching tonight with long memories may recall that we used to hold this event in a restaurant in Ballyshannon. Uh, when the COVID pandemic turned all the festival plans upside down, we changed to an online format. And even though the 2022 Allingham Festival is organized primarily as a series of live events, we are continuing to organize the awards ceremony as an online event. Uh, there are several reasons for this. And one of which is we now receive entries from all over the world. Uh, the online ceremony makes it possible for international winners to participate. Last year, we had winners from Canada and Australia. And as you will see, it's turned out to be a good idea for this year too. In 2022, we received 434 entries to the competition. There were 109 flash fiction entries and 325 poems. Uh, this was a record number of entries, more than last year, but in almost exactly the same proportion, about three poems for every flash fiction piece, both years. Uh, I find that intriguing. I wonder if that means that there are three times as many poets as there are prose writers. Uh, that's a subject for someone to study. Just a word about how the competitions are organized. Uh, the rules stipulate that the poems can be up to 40 lines in length and the flash fiction can be up to 700 words. Uh, it's completely open with respect to themes and subject matter. And this year, as you'll hear, there, are a, there is a wide range of topics. Most of the entries were sent in online, but some by post, and they're all judged the same. Uh, each entry is assigned a code number, and the judges do not know the names of the authors when they're judging. Uh, filter judges review all the entries and choose uh, a number of them for the shortlists. And then final judges choose first, second, and third place winners. They also may choose to acknowledge other entries as highly commended. And those pieces, along with the winners, will be published on the Allingham website. These are not easy choices to make. But let's get to the business at hand. This year, the final judge for the Allingham Poetry Competition is Kate Ennels. Kate is the author of three collections of poetry titled At the Edge, Threads, and Elsewhere. She's also the winner of the Westport Arts Festival Poetry Competition, and her work has been published in Cranog, the International Lakeview Journal, Boyne Berries, and many other journals. She organizes a series of literary readings called At the Edge, and those readings are funded by the Cavan Arts Office. Before she earned her MA in writing at NUI Galway, Kate worked in UK local government in the Irish community sector, and she is currently a board member of Penn Ireland, which is an organization that opposes censorship and lobbies for the release of imprisoned writers all around the world. Kate, thank you for being with us tonight. Please let us know your choices for the poetry competition. Okay, well, it's great to be here, very exciting. Um, and in fact, it's been a real privilege to judge this year's Ellingham Poetry Competition. I love to read poems, so to be able to delve into a whole host of them and go on so many different journeys was a bit of a treat. So first of all, Tom, thank you for asking me. So every judge says this, I know, and it's a little annoying to hear, but I found it really difficult to choose my final poems. The poems were so interesting and covered a range of themes, identity, death, loss, war, cruelty, loneliness, family, friendship. I want to thank the filter judges because Allingham, as Tom says, received over 320 poetry submissions and the 35 poems they sent me to judge on took me on amazing journeys around the world, meeting many different people. Um, it was Billy Collins who suggested that instead of thinking about what a poem means. We should look at it as a journey and look at where it takes us. And he reckoned that if people took this approach, poetry would be far less frightening and immensely more pleasurable. So this is how I read a poem. At its conclusion, I think, what was my journey? Where did I go and what did I see? 
Often my journey through a poem is like dancing through a fabulous landscape. And because good poems use images and metaphor as well as sound and rhythm, that's how it works. And for me, it's usually the sensual or visceral image along with the sound and position of the words that waltzes me through a poem. Following its steps, I find a reveal is important because for me, again, writing poetry is a means of expressing truth and a means of illustrating experience, belief or memories. So a truth or a, a reveal in a poem for me is important. Also for me, sound is crucial in poetry, whether it's rhyme, rhythm, or the sound of the words. Personally, I like assonance, consonance, alliteration, and I like to note how the placing of the words in the line affects the sound. Also, the physical of the appearance of the poem is important for me. It's like a sheet of music. If there are a thousand bars or clef or bass notes with too much musical notation, I get alarmed. So the layout, I think, is, is a very important thing. So my judging template was made up of various considerations, but basically I used the following four lenses. What is the journey I was taken on? What were the images used and did they work for me? Did I like the sounds in the poem? And did the poem look appealing? So just so people know, that's what I was thinking about. To get to the poets themselves, as I said, I struggled to choose the top three as requested by Tom. And while I was honored and delighted to be asked to judge, I don't know if I ever want to again. <laughs> I read and reread my favorite six. I recited them, I put them away, I went back to them. I made one decision and then I changed it. So it was difficult and I thought it was difficult to know that. Um, in the end, this is it. This is what I chose. But another day, it could have been something different. So highly commended was Matryoshka by Partridge Boswell. I loved the sensuality of the images and sounds in this poem and the slow reveal of the family characters. I also thought the structure was good. They were bite-sized stanzas filled with people and beauty. So third place is Luctus by Peggy McCarthy. I thought Luctus was a wonderful poignant poem. The images were bold and assertive and they journeyed me around the farm. Each stanza shows, stanza, sorry, shows a different scenario of the father, all of them unsettling. The words chosen to describe him at work were almost violent and the final line is devastating, yet it opens up the poem completely. I like my dance to end with a flourish, a bow almost, and I thought the title was very clever. So for me, the poem was compact, full of interesting things and full of rough sound and fury. Peggy uh, McCarthy's work has been published in numerous journals, including uh, Southward, Cran Oak, Skylight 47, Hold Open the Door from the Island Chair of Poetry and Fish Anthology. She won the Fish Poetry Prize in 2020. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, her poems have been shortlisted for the Gregory O'Donoghue Poetry Competition and the Patrick Kavanagh Poetry Award. She holds an MA in Creative Writing from UCC and lives in Waterford City. So Peggy, will you read the poem for us? Thank you, Kate, for those kind words. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be part of the Allingham Festival. <clears throat> Loctus. We'd stare at my father's left hand, slicing up and down, his elbow pivoting on the oilcloth, voicing words on the supper table when sentences dried up and broke. We'd watch him slump behind the rump of a cow in the milking stall, her jaws grinding as he clutched her bulk, head buried in her soft flank. We'd wait for him on an August evening, having marooned himself in a vast cornfield the scythe working him, lift, swipe, slash, felling the crop till well beyond nightfall. We track him hauling buckets from barn to churn, trailing splashes of cow hot milk, precious drops, creaming dark clay. 
he lingers yet in any desolate man I see. Oh, Peggy, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, that was lovely. Thank you very much, Peggy. My uh, second choice was First and Second Movement after Charles Simic by James Finnegan. Now, in my journey through uh, First and Second Movement, I experienced intrigue, wonder, with a haunting sort of music. It was almost like a scary nursery rhyme. I liked the commonplace about it, um, but the visceral images of the scarecrow made ordinary by Moriarty's field, yet a scarecrow that endured a violent journey through hobnail boots, graveyards, and being tied to a theater tree. Each of the two stanzas are full of compressed tension. At the end, after reading it, I felt terrified and bewildered, and the poem left me really affected. I enjoyed returning to it again and again. So James Finnegan was born in Dublin, it's the second prize winner in the 2022 Gregory O'Donoghue International Award competition and was shortlisted in the 2021 Bridgeport Poetry Prize and in the 2018 Hennessy Literary Awards for Emerging Poetry. A sonnet, The Weather Beaten Scarecrow, was published in the Irish Times in August 21. James, who taught in St Eunan's College for 33 years, holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Living Educational Theory from the University of Bath. James and Lavinia, along with their four-year-old Springer Spaniel Daisy, live a few kilometres outside Letterkenny in County Donegal. So I'm not sure if David, if uh, James is here, but we have a video, don't we, Tom? We do. Yeah. And Hello everyone. First and second movement. First, someone steals a scarecrow from Moriarty's field and places it in the village graveyard. During its first night, it gets scared and leaves its left hobnail boot by the dry stone wall. Second, a scarecrow is tied to the theatre tree to ensure an audience of at least one. Next morning, loosened ropes snake around the base of the bewildered oak. Thank you very much. <laughs> you see what I mean about <laughs> nursery rhyme, that sort of terror in it. Lovely poem. Um, okay, so... The first choice then was a poem called A Random List of Things, brackets that do not define me, close brackets, by Stuti Sinha. I don't know, I hope I'm co uh, pronouncing that correctly. But anyway, what a fabulous title to start with and it had me interested straight away. I love the abundance of sounds and strange new images in this poem and the slow reveal of the person behind the lines. It was a waltz through a field of wildflowers, daffodils, poppies, cornflowers, orchids, and so many flowers I didn't know. I loved the sounds of the Indian words, which unfurled themselves into the really comforting images that I do know, like winter mornings swaddled with fog. I loved the osmosis between the different cultures of the poet. And the images came thick and fast. And then behind the list was a family and a home, yet a confusion of belonging. It's a beautiful poem. I liked how the poem was structured in a list form as well as the bracketed retorts and the explanations to explain what the poet understands of the secrets and hidden unknown of her past. It was a clever tool to work and uh, clever, it was a clever tool to use and I thought it worked really well. So Stuti is an Indian writer and musician who lives in Dubai in the UAE. She writes primarily about the human experience and emotions. Being passionate about travel, she loves to weave different cultures and her heritage into her writing and that really came across. 
In 2022, she received the International Westmoreland Award for Fiction, an honourable mention in the Globe Soup Memoir Contest, and was also longlisted for the Urbachi Poetry Award. She was recognised in the 2021 annual haiku competition by the Society of Classical Poets and has been published in several literature magazines and small presses. Um, so, Stuti, will you read us the poem, please? Of course. Thank you so much, Kate. And um, thank you for those really wonderful words. Um, I'm especially gr glad the reveal um, stood out for you because if there's one thing I thought about writing this poem, it was about revealing myself. Um, so I'm going to read this. This is a list poem and it's called A Random List of Things That Do Not Define Me. One, the softness of a Jaipuri Rezai to curl into on winter mornings, swaddled with fog. My double blanket is very strictly meant for one. Two, feathery stems of baby's breath peeking playfully from an unpolished copper kettle. I repurpose old vessels as vases and stamp Indianness all over my home. Three, unraveling Rumi Sufism over a cup of Kashmiri kahwa. We lived across the street from Kashmiri neighbors and my Kashmiriness is a product of that osmosis. Four, rainbow folds of brocade and the earthy scent of their heritage behind the doors of Amma's wooden almari. I cradle a doll in one hand as I first secretly open that cupboard to inhale the fragrance of her saris and the stories tucked in their creases. Five, ruabs are served in opulent homes is no match for a glass of cold lemon sharbat on Kolkata's footpath. Rose flavored drinks and grandiosity both make me nauseous. Six, Barefoot tramples on a glistening carpet of dewdrops or oski chadar as my nani called it. I preserved my grandmother carefully in the stories passed down to me. Our lives didn't intersect. Seven, to always switching the evening lamps on before dusk sets in. The dark rolling into light is known in my family as dosham. We have monikers for everything which become obscure because with time, imperialistic lingo adulterates our native tongue even more. Eight, the lingering lilt of guzzles on a second-hand sonodyne stereo. Our evening musical mehfils are open to all richly steeped in connection, despite that we can't afford the dust on our floors. Nine, tall paperbacks of Amar Chitra Katha in Hindi, over pocket-sized, Archie's comics in English, a tradition I will pass on to my children. P.S. I always make my lists odd. Well, thank you very much, Studi and Kate. Thank you very much for judging the poetry this year. Great choices. My pleasure. As we move into the flash fiction realm, I want to start by putting the spotlight on the Keene family trophy. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, I want to introduce you to Ali Keen, who is also known professionally as Alison Toomey. She serves as an owner, producer, and director for a film production company known as Real Films, Real Stories. She and her husband, Gary Keen, have developed outstanding documentary films, including the film Gaza in 2019, which was nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, and it has won many humanitarian international awards. They're currently producing a new film titled In the Shadow of Beirut in collaboration with uh, Hillary Clinton. I'd like to invite Ali Keen to tell us about the background of the Keen Family Award, please. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Tom. Um, just a little slight correction there. We were long listed for the Academy Awards. We didn't get shortlisted, so we got very, very close. <laughs> Thanks, for, <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> so to talk about Jim, uh, I, I went rooting through um, newspapers because I remembered he was published in the Irish Times a long time ago. And I found an article that he had written um, about writing. And I think this sums it, this sums it up his um, 
his experience with the Allingham Awards. In an Irish Times article dated December 2000, Jim wrote the following words, which encapsulated Jim's love of the written word and his true appreciation for the Allingham Arts Society. The written word has always held a deep fascination for me. My urge to write was enhanced when I came to live in Ballyshannon and joined the Allingham Arts Society in 1979. I was its chairman for about 12 years. Each year, the society runs a literary competition. And through these, I met a number of adjudicators who were themselves established writers. I attended all their weekend workshops. Writing schools, workshops, and writer in residence projects are of great value to any aspiring writer. They motivate, broaden the perspective, help to improve writing and communication skills, and psychologically, they can be very beneficial. Without their influence, I doubt I would ever have reached this level of progress in my own writing. I, this is Mina. I vividly remember every year Jim gearing up for the Allingham Arts Festival, polishing off his own poetry and short story submissions of which he won many, organizing events and workshops, speaking with writers and generally buzzing off the whole event. It was a real highlight in his year. It has been a great honor and privilege for us, the Keane family, to maintain strong links and keep alive Jim's passion for the Allingham Arts Festival and the written word by presenting this trophy in his name for the Flash Fiction Awards. Well, thank you, Ali. Uh, the final judge for this year's Allingham Flash Fiction competition is Mia Gallagher. Mia is the author of two novels, Hellfire and Beautiful Pictures of the Lost Homeland. Her short story collection titled Shift was published in 2018. Her short fiction has been published widely in Ireland and abroad. She's a contributing editor to The Stinging Fly, and she has enjoyed the role of writer in residence in many locations. Her reviews, articles, and essays have been published in the Irish Times, The Guardian, The Sunday Independent, Stinging Fly, Architecture Ireland, Circa, and Books Ireland. She's a member of Eostana, a national organization that honors artists whose work has been made, who has made an outstanding contribution to the creative arts in Ireland. Mia, please share with us your thoughts about this year's flash fiction entries. Thank you so much, Tom, for um, that lovely introduction. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the whole team for doing such a fantastic job in organizing the festival and in organizing these awards. It was really amazing listening to Ali talk about Jim. And it just reinforced and emphasized how important in our culture, in our society generally, the arts are, how important it is for people to be able to express themselves and find ways of speaking their truth and find it in a way, a pace, the language, a voice that's right for them. Like Kate, it was quite tricky making my final decisions. And I, first of all, like to really thank the filter judges. 109, okay, it's not 320 submissions, but it's still pretty phenomenal. And those filter judges were amazing in whittling down the final 12. I read them, I would say I read them about six times. And each time it was really, it was almost like peeling off the skin of, of, of saying goodbye to somebody and going, okay, I really love you, but you're, you're going to stay to one side and then narrowing it down to the, to the final um, selection. There was a range of themes, there was a range of styles, they seemed to be coming from all over the world, which was what I really love reading blind. So I love not knowing who submitted, I love not having any indications as to ethnicity or gender identity, sexual orientation. I, I really think it's very important because like everybody, like every human being, I'm coming with my own prejudices and my, and my own expectations. So simply to meet the story on its own terms and to build a relationship with the story and the writing is a fantastic thing. So thank you so much for the way that you organized that. So the themes that were in the shortlist were love, 
desire, art, vengeance. There were some very interesting younger pieces. There was uh, Kurt Vonnegut, who's one of my all time favorite writers, made an appearance, as did Edward Hopper. And um, yeah, so I, I found it when it came to the last four or five, it was really tricky. So I was cheekily said to Tom, listen, can I highly commend one piece? So I'll start off by mentioning, oh, I should say, yeah, before I get into that, sorry, a bit of delayed uh, gratification for everybody listening here. Um, I was very impressed listening to Kate describe her very nuanced and multi-dimensional way of assessing and responding to poetry. And um, for me, it's, it's, I remember somebody telling me once, I think I was assessing submissions for the stinging fly or something. And someone said to me, well, you know, there's no maybe it's, do you, and I was thinking, yeah, no, there is no maybe. And for me, it's a question of, do I love this? And do I love this more than I love something else? So it's very much an instinctive um, response, a gut response, a heart response, a head response, a sonic response, a mouthfeel response, a sense of like, oh, where is it taking me physically? How do I feel? Like, am I on the back of a horse that's going to take me down a, a strange kind of countryside? Or am I being invited into a small, dark room? So these are kind of things that I don't really like I wouldn't write small dark room on on a story that I'm reading but I I'm I'm always listening to my own visceral and physical reactions and and answers to what what the text is calling up in me so yes of course on a technical level these translation to story into arc so the shape of the story into surprise is it surprising me in some way I do love a bit of a shock <laughs> um, like great scarecrows. Um, what's where? Where does it end? Like for me, the ending of a piece of writing, or the ending of a piece of any kind of sequential work, whether it's music or film, television, um, it's almost an opportunity in my own experience for the writer to make a, a kind of moral statement. It's like every time I leave a story, every time I leave a novel or even an article, I'm making a decision about where I want to leave the reader, what in what psychological and emotional and physical place I want to leave the reader. So where are these stories leaving me at the end and how do I feel about that? Obviously language, like what is, how, how is the language, how is the writer being using the language and how does that make me feel? How is it grating up against the way I would use language? Um, in some ways, the politics of a piece is quite important. And politics, small politics, how are the interactions and the human relationships dealt with? Because generally short stories are, whoops, nearly lost my notes, but generally short stories are about people in situations. So what are the, what is the writer telling me about how they see relations, how they see people, how they see family dynamics, how do they see formation psychological but also where what world does the story create and how does this speak to the moment the present moment how does this speak to where i am as a human animal in a very precarious chaotic unsettled momentous change world um and it's this isn't you know like this isn't, I hate the word woke because it's so dismissive. Um, what's wrong with being awake? Um, but um, this isn't a sort of box ticking exercise and oh yes, it deals with this issue, that issue. But politics are, you know, once you have people, you have politics, you know, um, once you have animals, there is politics. So yes, so I, I kind of look at a story again in a very um, intuitive, I'm not kind of like pouring through it uh, intellectually. But I do, I am kind of, I suppose, listening to what it's telling me. So, so there is sort of the, the basic kind of uh, matrix of things that inform how I respond to fiction, how I respond to any piece of writing and determine how I love them, essentially. So on to the four pieces, which I'm going to talk briefly about tonight. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the story that I highly commended, and this was this is really a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. It's called Sweaty Deli Ham, 
Um, and that's Delhi, like a delicatessen, not Delhi um, as in the city. And the writer is Luca Mellis. And I just found, I just loved the story. I was, I was impressed was the word that really kept coming up for me. I was like, wow, how is this writer managing to do this? The prose, as you'll see when it's up on the website is sharp, surprising and compelling. The rhythm really kept me on my toes. And there was a real sense of play and mischief, irreverence. It felt like it was challenging me the whole time as to what I thought about the characters, what I thought about the narrator, what I thought about this world, this very unfair world world that these people were in and I was simultaneously felt both inside and outside the actions as they unfolded it's about younger people people much younger than me but you know I was young once so I can identify so I felt like I was in that strange kind of young adult place where both inside the group and outside the group at the same time and I really liked that feeling it, it felt very current um, and not in a glib way, it felt genuinely like it was speaking, speaking to the moment, blistering with youth, balancing an acerbic social commentary. At one stage, he talks, he reduces these two people. There was Sally Rooney tote bag is one, uh, one person and Joe Rogan something I can't remember it was maybe Joe Rogan wannabe or something was the other person and I, I I had to look up Joe Rogan which shows like how up to date my references are but I could see the Sally Rooney tote bag person absolutely um Marianne maybe with a with a with a fringe so um so it has this acerbic social commentary but oh my god this terrible sad profound sense of alienation and it ended beautifully like it was like a gorgeous concerto that just left me somewhere that I was really so it was a real struggle to say my love you are not in the top three but I love you all the same and thank you Tom <laughs> for allowing me to highly commend it I just want to mention a little bit about Luca Melis and um, its writer so Luca is already impressing the world. He was chosen as one of four outstanding young writers to attend the 2022 Courch Festival as a guest of the Irish Writers' Centre. I actually had heard him read in the Writers' Centre, so, but I, I only found out that afterwards when I, oh yeah, that's Luca. He has a very bright future in my opinion, IMO. And so please keep your eyes peeled. Now we're on to the official winners to those I loved the most. So in third place, I chose Gym Floor by Rachel Alexander, who I'm delighted is here this evening. Hey, Rachel. Um, this story, wow. So on my very first read, I just thought, wow, this is really angry. This is a really angry piece. And yet it's incredibly delicate. And I, there was something about that tension and conflict that really pulled me in. Often I think of writing that writers often have two poles that they go to and those, the interest and the tension in the writing is how they balance their tendency to go to one pole with their tendency to go to the other. And often the writing for me is strongest when that's really held almost like a, a, a tight wire. So, you know, they never go fully into say, if it's melodrama or whatever. So there was something very cerebral and structured about this piece. And there was something very viscerally furious about it. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed having to, having to figure out where I was and what I felt about that. It wouldn't go away. So it was one of those ones where I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's really good on the first read. That's very good. Yeah, and really speaks to the moment. And then I was like, no, no. Every time I, I reread it, it sort of lodged deeper into me and I really admired that. And then I was starting to think, what is it about this story that's that's not that's refusing to let me put it to one side and that's in, insisting I take it seriously? So partly it's the um, what it does with its structure, with it, what it takes, it takes something familiar. It takes these two individuals who are familiar to the narrator and who are familiar types to, to me. The reader and in a very cunning slate it twists time and space around like I love a bit of you know time traveling and um parallel time frames and Rachel does this beautifully like so she manages to to shift time so I'm I'm in the present I'm in the past I'm in the further past I'm and I really liked that feeling of disorientation but it, in this twisting the people these familiar boys these familiar lads bros become new and they become strange 
And in the gap between what they were and what they are is the narrator and the narrator is lost. And I just thought that was very sad, actually. And I think that's why this story absolutely deserves um, to be in my top three. The other thing which came to me yesterday is like, it's quite hard to be honest these days. <laughs> it's a very, we live in a very irony saturated culture. And I remember a young cousin of my husband's a couple of years ago, um, I said something about cynicism and she said, what cynicism? And I was like, oh, bless you. I want to be that person. What is cynicism? Um, but art without honesty, what sort of art is that? What function does it have in our world? What does it serve? Art without honesty is no art at all. And this, if nothing else, in addition to its other gifts, this above all is an honest piece addressing huge issues in its slender frame. Rachel, who I'm delighted is going to be reading it tonight, is 24. Rachel Alexander is 24, based in Burr, Offaly. Incredibly impressive. Um, I won't say young writer because it sounds like I'm really ancient. So that's just vanity, Rachel. Um, but a very impressive emerging writer. She's a degree in English literature from UCC, an MA in screenwriting from the University of the Arts London. Her writing has been published in print and online. And she's performed her work in many venues, including the Cork International Short Story Festival, which is a coup. Uh, Rachel currently has two projects going into development with Lammas Park, founded by Fangirl Moment, the amazing British film director, Steve McQueen. I'm so jealous, Rachel, but oh my God, he's so lucky to have you. So Rachel, can you read us Jim Floor? I can, thank you Mia for those kind words. It's amazing. And I'm a very gentle person in real life. So I think it is, you know, I'm lucky that I have writing to channel feelings and emotions and everything into it. And it's been such a pleasure to be here tonight and to listen to all of your wonderful words. So. Thank you. This is Jim Floor. I look up and watch the sweat roll along my arm and land in a perfect plop on the floor. Veins protruding, pulsing, shooting blood around my body, keeping me alive. I am alive. To my left, a young man, a gifted GAA player, a happy-go-lucky-go-suck-my-dick kind of guy. He doesn't have the decency to look me in the eye or say my name or acknowledge that brief moment of teenage history that sits between us on this gym floor. The music throbs in my ears and I'm back in the club and I'm feeling bad because I've already said no a few times. But you were persistent, so I said OK. You didn't take my hand as I followed behind you, five and a half pints of cider swirling inside my empty stomach. You didn't take my hand as you led me through the streets of a town that I call home and I was 17 and that was a time when the only thought that crossed my mind when a, wa when a man looked me up and down and licked his lips like he could eat me up and spit me out was, wow, this is my power. We went to the playground and you didn't have the decency to sit on the swings and make small talk. Instead, you headed straight under the monkey bars and whispered into my ear. There were no sweet nothings and the hairs prickled on my neck as you said it. Will you give me head? Now, I've been asked this before and when I said no, I was told that I was different to the other girls in this town. When I said no, I was told that I was different to the other girls in this town. And again, I said no, but you were persistent. So I said, okay, so I said, you can't tell anyone. You licked your lips and said it can be our secret. My knees crunched down on gravelly ground and I did the deed, the promise agreed and all the while I thought of the countless times my knees have touched this ground but never like this, not quite like this. And all the while I felt the ghost of me watching from the swings, questions burning in her dark eyes. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Does it feel nice? To my right, another young man, a quiet guy, a rather shy guy, the boy I married when I was four years old and he held hands and we held hands every day and raced through that very playground. What is she doing? Does that feel nice? He has the decency to look me in the eye, but his eyes flicker away and I think it's the guilt that sits between us or maybe the shame. Because I was back from the playground and I was back in the club and he left me on the dance floor with a smile on his face that made me think that this is a secret that will be told, no promise agreed. 
And then I bumped into him, my childhood lover, my little companion, and we laughed and joked about being in love or our idea of love. When I got home, I took the duvet to my chin and pushed the visions of the playground to the back of my brain. In the dark, I scrolled through the glow of my phone until a notification appeared. A Snapchat video from my little ex-husband, a Snapchat video of his dick in his hand and he was yanking and wanking over my name. And I was alone in the dark, lying with this rising feeling that couldn't be stilled. Is this my power? Does this feel nice? I look up, my sweat still resting on this gym floor. To my left and to my right, two great young men, two promising young men, two young men joking and laughing on this gym floor while I hang my head back down and stare at my gathering sweat, protruding, pulsing, shooting something around my body keeping me alive. I am alive. Does this feel nice? Thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah, wow. And beautiful to hear it as well and uh, beautifully read. Um, thank you again. Uh, the story I chose for second place is really different. Um, it is Dueling at the Lime Kiln by Shane Levy. Yeah, now I went on a real journey with this one. So when I started reading it, I thought, God, this is really weird. Is this like a novel or something? You know, um, it just it, it was like, oh, this is feels like a historical novel. I don't know. I mean, why is it going into flash and <laughs> why has it been shortlisted? And then about half the page down, I started going, oh, oh yeah okay right and I then I was in the world and I stopped asking silly judgy questions and I just was like what is going on here and who are these people and then I was I I really began to care about the the narrator the protagonist uh and I was like oh my god and then suddenly Shane did this amazing um, twist and I could see nature and it was like this guy really knows how to write about a tree in winter so I was my senses were then completely engaged and then I was getting very anxious as as I hope you all will when you hear it being read and the stakes got higher and my heart was beating faster and then <laughs> then came the ending and I was like yeah yeah and that's really I was just, yeah. Um, and I'm trying to, hang on, I'll just see if I can see what I wrote on it. It was like, uh, something like, blah, blah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was wow in the, la <laughs> the last line. Um, I really felt like I'd been walloped in the gut and that felt like a good thing. Um, and I think that's that's what's really interesting about flash like there is no I'm, I'm not really a fan of how to write flash or how to write anything you know I think that the best bit of advice I would have got is like just just try to hear hear what's coming up and 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 be honest to that and also ask yourself if you have to ask yourself anything what am I doing here what is my thinking about doing this what's my thinking about that choice and what's my thinking about the other choice um but it was like this story really, you know, I just loved the audacity of it, I think, because it wasn't what I, I suppose I would have imagined a flash piece to be. It was it was completely went against that. And I just love the chutzpah, the courage and the daring of going, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to pack uh, like a Martin McDonough film into however many like 600 words or whatever it is, 700 words and and. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you along with it. You know, you may resist it, but I'm going to bring you along with it. And I think like life is short. I think we only have one shot at it. Maybe we don't, but even if I have another shot at it, it won't be as me. So it's like, why not do the thing that seems impossible? Why not take the risk, take the chances and just go, you know what? They say it can't be done, but I think I will. Um, I think I've blathered on enough about it. I just want to, I just want to hear you read it now and hear what it sounds like. But first I'll introduce you. 
Shane Levy is a writer and researcher based in Glencar, County Leitrim. His work has been published by many magazines and anthologies, including Trasna, Pop Shot, The Road Not Taken, Infinite Worlds, and the Jacked Crime Anthology. Great name. He likes to write fast moving stories with characters who are overwhelmed by events. And this is one of them. Fasten your seat folks everywhere. Everyone, <laughs> this is Shane Levy with Dueling at the Lime Kiln. Thanks so much, Mia. Uh, appreciate that. The porridge is getting cold. I'm trying to spoon it into me because today, God help me, I don't want an empty belly, but my throat's a knot and it just sticks in my teeth. I look up. Mam's at the fire, heating an iron, striking up sparks with a poker. She has her old green Galway shawl on, frayed and patched and patched. I slip me bowl to the floor where the dog starts slobbering over it, and I stagger up. Wall needs mending down at Ballyogues, says ma'am, voice hollow in the fireplace. I can't fathom how on earth she hasn't heard, and I want to throw myself on her skirt and cry, but I can't even trust myself to speak, so I just grunt and grab my cap. My head clips the patch on the way out, and the blast of sunlight is a needle to my head. I feel like I've been up drinking seawater all night. My stomach rolls like an eel in a trap. I shake my head and try to walk. There's Mary Egan, milking a cow. Hiya, Tommy, she shouts, and I nod, but my face is clenched tight. I must look a mess. Mary doesn't notice. She sings quietly and the cow swishes its tail. That cow is destined one day to be butchered for the stew pot. But today it blinks its liquid eyes and gazes at me in peace. I pass my Uncle Dom's cottage, which has gotten all grimy and green. I promised him I'd whitewash it, but I'll be dead before dinner. The world blurs before my eyes. It's cold. Everything glitters with dew. The winds are glazed with cobwebs and the swallows cluster together, impatient. It'll freeze in another few weeks, and that'll be the first frost. I almost laugh, but it chokes in my throat. The first frost, uh, frost I'll miss after my death. Yet in all that cold with the bluish smoke of morning fires twisting up from every cottage I pass, in that chill with my knuckles cut with cold, I am soaking in sweat. I know what I look like. I look like defeat. That's what Dom said he heard an officer say before Ballinamuck, when Humbert was beaten. With the redcoats closing in, this fella looked at the rebels and said, we look like defeat. Dying today. Being chopped to bits by a sword. My God, Brendan, Quinn is twice my size. My brain fizzes like the kettle on the fire. I can't stop thinking it over, trying to fathom a way out. It's a dream. I can't believe my feet are taking their last walk from Clon Lynn to Michaelstown. I just push my head forward and let my feet plunge ahead because if I stop, I'm going to curl up in a ditch and then I am finished. There isn't a soul who will look me in the eye for fleeing a jewel. There's clatter ahead, but it's just your man Fitzmore Steen and his stallion heading for the hunt. If Brendan and me have to kill, can't we rise up together and kill him and his kind? They ignore me. I have to scramble into the ditch to keep out of the hooves. I rub the sweat out of my eyes. I can't breathe. I can't swallow. I'm like a fish in the boat flopping about gulping. There is the crowd. The kiln empty today. Uh, Martha Nikonkol giggling with her bright eyes. My hopes there have come to nothing after all. There's Brendan. Someone is showing him a sword and he's slashing at grass with it. I'm dead. But something stops me and I blink as Brendan scowls and flail flails about with the sword. There, under his arm, the darkness of damp. He's sweating. Here in the chill autumn with the hose reddening on the thorn, he's scared. And I know in a rush what he looks like. He looks like defeat. I think I'm going to kill this bastard. I am.
fantastic yeah god yeah i'm just so i'm still so with him and i was thinking the other thing that i love um about it is that it reminds me of young arthur mcbride and that brilliant um uh, video of that with donald mccann down by the by the sea and you know it's like there's this whole historical context in it um and historical uh commentary as well like really fabulous like kate has just said brilliant tension shane absolutely concur yeah that's the word yeah i look like defeat yes <laughs> i'm delighted uh thank you for reading it as well um okay so finally it's my extremely great pleasure to introduce tonight's winning flash the absolutely gorgeous summer of 73 by Francis Gapper. Now, when I read this, I just fell in love with it. The very first time I read it, I fell in love from its very first tiny sentence. And I just gonna pull it up here. I it it just I don't know, I was there. So sometimes like with with work. I often find that it's easier to, to criticize, to find the words, to speak about something critically or to talk about what I don't like. You know, you, you, you watch something and a friend of yours hates it and you love it. And it's like, who's going to win the argument, the person who hates it. So it, I think it's because when something really speaks deeply, it often hits me in that pre-verbal place. So that place where I maybe have been a very young child, which I was in 73. Um, and um, I, I just loved the voice. I loved the world. I mean, I and when I started reading it, what I felt, I felt like, oh, yeah, this is this is America somewhere. And I was in like Sookie Stackhouse's world or I was in maybe some of Donna Tartt's writing. And um, it, it just brought me to a place where I could recognize, which wasn't my world, but which I could recognize and which I felt really great affection for and then I found out who Frances was and where she lives and where she comes from and suddenly that that those uh resonances and those associations that I built with the story it's like getting to know somebody maybe online and then you meet them in the flesh and then you you have another layer of associations so my the other layer of associations that grew over the first was Kate Atkinson and her amazing novels of northern England and how I love her voice, her sardonic, but passionate, incredibly compassionate voice, her, her cleverness with language, her storytelling, her ability to pack so many things into such a short amount of space. Um, Frances, I just loved, I loved who was telling me the story whether it was France, I didn't know it was Francis. I didn't know who it was, but I just loved her. I loved, I, I'm, I imagined a woman and I just loved her. I wanted, I wanted to be her friend and I wanted to hear her stories. I loved her world. I loved the way it seemed on the outside, but also how she not just invited me into an external world of people and objects and places and weather and the movement of celestial bodies and a strange kind of magic lurking underneath all that and her future and her past, but she also invited me into her soul, into her hopes and her fears. And there was something about this, it was like meeting somebody that I'd met years ago and that I'd met when I was a child years ago, that I'd met maybe in 1973. So I had a very deep personal um, connection with this. And, and uh, yeah, Poppy Z. Bright was somebody else who came to mind, Willie Vloughton as well. Um, this really is a gem and it's easy to be hyperbolic, especially at award ceremonies. But I think of what a gem is and a gem is usually it's a small thing. It's precious. It's multifaceted. Often it's been shaped and carved. It's been set. There is craft usually gone into presenting a gem. You can wear a gem. You can wear it on your on your ring finger. You can wear it close to your heart. And this one just there was no way this was ever going away. And I was just like worried that um, I wasn't going to give the other stories a fair enough chance if I made up my mind to. But I was like, you know, like Bruce used to say on Strictly Come Dancing, you're my favorite. Well, I was like, so uh, and this is 
you know, given that the other stories. So my job was really to ensure that my personal connection to this by reading and rereading was like, yes, this is the story that for me in this moment, in this time speaks to me. Immediate yet nostalgic, domestic yet speaking to so many bigger things, popular culture, weather, as I said, the movements of celestial bodies, even witchcraft. Um, it has so much humor in it. It will break your heart. Superb, I wrote in capital letters on my very first read. That hasn't changed. And so I'm just so thrilled to have met Francis, even if it's virtually, but particularly, I mean, like that's what's great about having something like this online. We can meet virtually and kind of our eyes can meet not just through your characters, but across the camera, the weird camera world of Zoom. And so I just introduce Frances. She lives in Cradley Heath in the UK's Black Country region. Her microfictions have been published in loads of places. The annual Best Microfiction Anthologies by Pelicanesis Press. And her flashes have, have appeared in many online literary mags. And I'm just going to name a few here, including Splunk, Wiggly, New Flash Fiction Review and the Dribble Drabble Review. I just picked the ones with the names that appeal to me the most. And I'm absolutely thrilled that everybody who's who's logged on tonight and everybody who will be watching this in the future will get a chance to hear this superb story. Francis Gapper and Summer of 73. Uh-oh. Francis, I think you have to unmute yourself if you can. And um, so you see, this is great now. This will be recorded for posterity. This is me trying to be um, tech savvy. So do you see the bottom, and I'm a bit dyspraxic about left and right. Do you see the bottom left of your screen and there's a microphone? I think I've done it. You're good. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, lovely, thank you. Mia, thank you so much for your kind words, which really mean an awful lot to me. Um, summer of 73. Expecting quintuplets, flowery voluminous, I chuck out the miniskirts and Randy buys a suede scoop chair for our open plan lounge, redecorated in earth tones. But we're keeping the bedroom flamingo pink. I am not a cranky vegetarian. Names we finally settled on, Ryan, Brian, Kevin, Gary, and Todd, or Heidi, Randy, Kimberly, Tammy, and Tina, or pick and mix. My birth plan for me to immerse Nate in warm water and them to fizzy pop out of me, giggling and splashing. Tina doing widths, Kimberly daring Brian to touch the bottom of the pool. I asked my friend Eileen about her birth plan when she had Samantha. Me, she says, I self-hypnotized. I wasn't there at all. Eileen, worry lines and spaghetti straps. A witch who dances naked under the moon. Behind the potting shed, this being the only place in their garden, not overlooked by nosy neighbors. Although she doesn't summon up spirits, she believes in the power of thought to control the telling. She's been requesting David Carradine. We're both crazy for David because he is pure. Unlike our slime ball husbands. In Kung Fu, he plays a monk with a shaved head who fights baddies. Any luck? I ask. Eileen says, no, they keep sending her televangelists. I echo on to try again, and Shazam! Her hocus pocus conjures up an American talk show. Guest star, David Carradine. Fab! With long hair, which we approve of. But also, bummer, 
a hippie chick girlfriend called Seagull. I wonder if I could rename myself Albatross. A baby starts howling off stage and Seagull runs to fetch him. The audience ahs, but he's still grouchy, so she whips out her tit. Quick ad break, following which the host asks David for his, his opinion. Breastfeeding on the box, yes or no? Our hero shrugs. It's cool. I adore him. Meanwhile, Eileen has become hysterical, so I slap her. She collapses into our tub chair. The juniors are jigging. They can't wait to be rugrats. I put my arms around myself to soothe them. Once Eileen has revived, I make pink squirrels. My mind is still on free, Seagull's baby. What bliss, I say dreamily. Oh, what joy to suck the nipple and be pressed into the breast. Eileen shakes her finger at me. Night, Randy is snoring. Can't sleep on either my back or side and obviously not on my front. I'm ridiculously enormous. I stand at the window. A magnificent full moon is sailing through the clouds. She looks pregnant too, with moon embryos or new universes. I lift my arms to her and dance. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. And can we bring uh, Ali Keen back, please, at this point in the proceedings? Hello there. Uh, thank you, Francis, for that. That was absolutely stunning. Thank you so much, Mia, for all the hard work you put into uh, reading all the stories and trying to find a winner. I don't know how you did it. Um, the three stories, the three, the four, uh, the specially mentioned uh, story, and then the three finalists are just incredible. And I know Jim would have fully appreciated and understood the work and the difficulty that goes into creating um, a short story and a great story and something that stays in your heart and your soul. So well done, Rachel. Shane and Francis. Um, it gives me great pleasure um, to present the James B. Keane Allingham Award for Flash Fiction. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, to you, Francis Gaffer. Well done. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ali. Francis, thank you. Mia, everyone who's involved here, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your ideas with us. We'll uh, uh, at this point, we're going to get one of the special treats of the Poetry and Flash Fiction Awards ceremony because we're going to ask our judges to read a short piece uh, uh, from their own work. Kate Ennels, uh, can you share some of your own poetry with us, please? Kate? Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, lovely. Thank you. I hope you don't regret this. <laughs> so I'll just read a few poems. Um, uh, the first one's called Love After Mila Hauga, Haugova. Love. I can't tell you anything about that, except some say it starts in the eye, others the gut. I believe it's all fingers and lips and the tongue is essential. It starts as a beautiful bubble quivering, full of breath and light, wobbling and goofy, attached to a wand. As it floats away, it seals itself into a perfect sphere of tension and air. But soon the beautiful bursts on the sharp prick, brick drips into the Friday night puddles, splashed with oil or diesel becomes a ripple, a dull spear of colour, a smashed broken bottle glittering beneath an orange street light. Okay, the next one's um, about London, recalling London, London's where I come from. 
originally 35 years ago. Recalling London. When I recall London, it's not Big Ben's pale face, nor the changing guard at Buckingham Palace. It isn't the Wedgwood portraiture in Regent's Park, nor theatre cues at Charing Cross. It's not the number 29 double-decker bus, not acrobats juggling at the Opera House, or the strange delicacies of Borough Market, not the crisscross of train tracks at Paddington, or the Persian exhibit at the Victoria and Albert. It's not Diplodocus in the Natural History Museum, not the diseased flutter of St James's pigeons. It's not the dead fish splayed on slabs in Brixton, nor the vendors holler, holler in Camden Lock, nor the fancy of Kentish Town's old castle. It's you, mother, wizened in a basement in Stockwell, with an orange glint in the black of your eye, banging a silver zimmer on the floor in frustration, screaming guttural rage with no place to go. It's you who spotlight my recall of London. Okay, one more, which is again a bit grim, but then we'll move on to lighter things. Um, this is in memory, a poem I wrote in memory of the 16 young gay men who were murdered in London in the 1980s. It's called Blocked Drains. No one noticed they were gone, butchered, minced, flushed down the toilet, heads too big to fit the S-bend, so splintered instead with the joiner's mallet. It was only when the drains in Muswell Hill were blocked with skin and spleen, human liver and kidneys, and a man arrested who mentioned more dismembered remains could be found buried in Cricklewood. Then the police stirred, found a shovel, started to dig. In the mirror, a copper talked of a lover's tiff. Newspapers shouted, murder, homosexuals. Of course, scandal sells red tops. So did the body parts, the tongues, the intestines, arms, legs, hearts of young gay men. Only three of them ever pieced back together again. Their disappearance and death hadn't been noted. These boys were unimportant, young puffs, queers, out and down, hanging out in the golden lion, homeless, trying to avoid the attentions of the pretty police. Dismissed, ignored by the rest of us. It was their shared misfortune and a killer's want of glory that forced us to know just a part of them for a very short time. Okay, um, I'll just read two more, a bit lighter. This is um, about you know, what you need to be careful what you say in front of a poet. It's called The Poet's Revenge. Curse words were certainly part of the mix, but it was more the tone, the intake of breath, the snort, the splash of sneer, the silvery jeer and smirk that pricked my alert when I heard poets indeed. Who the fuck does she think she is? The exchange took place between spa lockers under white towels amid perfumed bottles, among a morass of thick ankles, drooping bell bosoms and bottoms, flabby forearms, fatty ripples of flesh, all being squished and zipped only to fade on lipstick flecked teeth when she turned back to look in the mirror. And there I stood. And the last one is, it's called, it's quite an old poem actually. What word would you choose to be? I'd want a word with body, cute with curly cues, a word to curl your tongue, alert, inveigle you in close. A word with a whisper of intrigue, onomatopoeic. I could be a call of nature, a reverberation, a craw in the back of the throat, or be meaningful like the bleat of a newborn kitten tied up with sisters in a sack of stones. I'd like to 
sound like a badge of courage or a shout for change, a scream maybe, but I'd want my word to make you laugh, signal cunning. I'd want to be a clever sound packed with guile, colour, a flash of solar, a ray of lunar, scarlet with a green feather boa, be burlesque like a Rubens character. Eureka! If I could pick a word to be, the word I'd choose is fleshy. Well, Kate, thank you. Wow, if you read like that at the at the edge events, I think you're going to have a much larger audience. Um, <laughs> Mia, do you have a short piece that you can share with us tonight? Yes, I do. Um, and it's it's a it's actually I think it's the shortest um, story I've ever written. And I'm I'm known, I suppose, if I'm known at all, I'm known for writing rather lengthy novels. So um, but before I read it, because it is very short, I'm just going to give you a little preamble about it. Um, and I guess the reason for this preamble is like often the writer's life appears when there's a bit of success like tonight and uh, work has been selected or you know you've won a prize or whatever um, it it can feel like a very sort of um, straightforward thing oh so and so started here and they ended here and that was great but I in my experience stories and writing has a life of its own it can duck and dive and it can go through lots of different kind of strange alleyways until it reaches kind of um, the covers of a book. So the one that I'm going to read, I started it in 2005, I think, and that was for a competition where it didn't get placed and it was 250 words. So it was obviously for a very short, short competition. Then I, a couple of years later, and I was looking through all my folders yesterday, a couple of years later, then I bumped it up to 460. So 2007, it became 460 words. And I must have submitted it maybe to a 500 limit story, but again, it didn't get placed. So flash forward to see what I did there, flash fiction, um, to 2014 and an editor, Jessa Crispin, who used to edit this amazing literary on, online zine called Spolia, um, which, it, Unfortunately, I don't think you can find it beyond Tumblr, but she invited me to submit a piece for an issue called On the Theme of Disappearances. So I thought, oh, this one might work. So I put it into Spolia and it got published. So we're talking maybe nine years after I had first started writing it. So that was great. Then it was time to put my collection together, flash forward another four years. So shift, plug, plug which is available in all good bookshops. And if it isn't, just ask them to order it in from the publisher. But, um, and I thought, yeah, this will work quite well because I had another tiny flash which hadn't been published that I desperately wanted in the collection. So I thought the two of them would be like little bookends between all these longer stories. So um, it went up again, I think, by the, when it was in Spoli, it was 500 words and then it was 512 when it went into shift. And then Sinead Gleeson, uh, came to me in 2018 and said, hey, would you like to put a story into the art of the glimpse anthology? And I was like, oh yeah, fantastic. So it's the shortest story in the art of the glimpse. And I'm very, very proud of it being so tiny. And, <laughs> um, and its title is a nod to Hitchcock. It's a reference, I suppose, both um, to his gift for suspense and his dodgy attitude to the female protagonist. And what was interesting hearing Kate read her absolutely magnificent work is there are some parallels there. I'm always interested in readings. Also, the character is called Tommy. Hey, Shane, <laughs> like your guy. So it's called The Lady Vanishing. At dawn, Tommy does it. The cows are lowing, lark song in his ears. No bells chiming yet for the Easter Sunday mass. He gets her ready. He could leave her sleeping, curled up in her bed, but that wouldn't feel right. Not for his princess of Eastern promise. Black shoes first, shiny. Then the knickers, their favorite ones, the white, white with black lace. Oh, she's awake now. She watches. Silent, eyes wide as he pulls the flimsy up, lets the elastic snap around her waist. He's out of breath, had to do everything himself as usual because God forgive him, she is so bloody helpless. A sound, a sigh, her mouth is open. 
where are we? Surprise, honey. She's always loved it when he calls her that. Oh, honey. Oh, honey. My honey. He takes the red truck. The new woman in town likes that truck. Real cute, Tommy. You got some vision. Any room for any passengers? She's from Chicago. The other end of the planet from Honey. She's not too old. She has some money and dark wild hair and a crackling laugh that runs down Tommy's spine, lifts his balls and squeezes real slow. They're at the ugly end of the harbour. Honey stares out, the slate cliffs cut brutal into the cobalt sky, a huddle of giant bins filled with shattered glass, stinking sugar crusted plastic, soggy paper. He opens the door. She looks surprised. What are you? Shh, honey. A flicker, the breeze catching her hair. He expects another question, but she says nothing, just lets him lift her so bloody, helpless, out. Gold scream, wheel, lift on the wind. Look, he points west at the ocean, cool blue in the dawn, at America beyond it, and in its heart, Chicago, invisible, where all his hopes lie. Honey, look, he forces her head around to the ocean, makes her see this is why. What do they say in the agony columns? It's not you, it's me. She's weightless in his arms, cool. He touches her mouth, her shallow forehead, her staring eyes. She's trembling. Her hands are warming up under his fingers. He traces the numb, elegant length of her right leg from black, patent toe to lonely, filling hole. There's something wet in her eyes. <laughs> you got some vision, Tommy. He could smash her first break her, flatten her to an inch of his life, but that he feels would be cheating. So as he pushes her through the narrow mouth of the bin, she still herself enough to resist, scraping at him with her hard fingertips. He's glad of that in a way. She screeches when the rusted rim rips at her face, hisses as it carves a pink gash down her cheek. There's blood on her nose, his, he recoils. Her hands snap loose, push at him. He bats them back, shoving her in until she starts to crumple again, sinking slow and sad into the broken glass. Oh, poor honey, he starts to think, then stops himself. Enough of that now. He twists the key, runs the ignition. Mass first, then the full Irish. Oh, he's starving now, would eat the hands off of a skinny priest in the rear view mirror. He doesn't see. Her flattened foot in its black shoe uncoil, curling up from the mouth of the bin. One more gasp at blown up life. Put your lips together, honey, and a gull swoops, pecks, punctures. She sighs. Oh, wow. Mia, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who participated here tonight. Uh, I just want to wrap up by acknowledging the contributions of a couple of people who uh, we haven't seen, but who have been essential to the success of the evening. The filter judge for flash fiction this year was Jo Holmwood, herself a fine writer and former director of Kids Own Publishing Partnership. Filter judge for the poetry competition was Michael O'D. And Michael is launching his own book at the Allingham Festival, a book of poetry titled The Sound of Water We're Searching. His launch will take place on Sunday, the 6th of November at 2 p.m. I'd like to encourage everyone who's planning to attend the Claire Keegan interview at three Come an hour early and enjoy the launch of Michael's book. I'd like to, and I would especially like to thank Monica Korish for tech hosting this webinar broadcast with her calm and steadying presence. If you're watching the live broadcast of this ceremony, please take a look at the Allingham program to see other upcoming festival events. Starting tonight, the live events will include a concert by David Rooney and Chanel McGinnis a dunduckety mud-colored evening, which is a performance of readings from Ulysses. On Saturday, there'll be a revival of the Valley Tour, 
fe featuring literary ladies of the Northwest, an interview with veteran actor Ian McElhenney, a History Ireland Hedge School and the Bird on the Wire concert. And on Sunday, the Gather Again open mic event, including the PJ Drummond recitation competition, a Claire Keegan interview and a choral concert on the evening at St. Anne's Church. Thank you for joining the 2022 Allingham Poetry and Flash Fiction Awards. We'll hope to see you all again next year. Good night. <laughs>